this. So it's called Threat Modeling Toolkit, like I said. My name is Jonathan Marcel. Uh, a small summary, so I will go with my background, a bit of myself, but not that much, but more about what is threat modeling as well. Like we just said, uh, we'll have some actual questions because this talk is literally 10 times better if you ask anything. So about in the middle of the presentation, you will see slides uh, about those questions. So please jump on it because we need to go quick. I have a lot of content ready to go through. And so uh, our helper will be in the middle of the room and he will just jump at you with the mic. It's important because we are recording. So um, the core of this presentation is really like all the toolkit components, as you basically can see, so data flow diagram and attack tree. So I will jump right into it. And so my background, I'm actually right now application security engineer at Twitch. I'm the OWAS Media Project Leader. That is the project that will distribute uh, this kind of recording contents, <laughs> actually. Uh, I do have six since eight years, blah, 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 other years and stuff. What you need to know is that I'm really paranoid about threats since all my life. So that's those are all the street creds I need in order to do that talk. Like right now, I know where are the exits, or take out the glasses and stuff, or far is the sea and everything. So. So my threat modeling experience is basically like working in a SDLC and doing application security activities. So I'm like kind of broad AppSec engineers that does everything, mostly because most of the time, I don't know, I was alone <laughs> doing it, sniff. Uh, and so what you see right now, it's basically a drawing that I made. It's boxes that says those are the, act the steps that you can do in, in your SDLC, even if you're agile, it works. And the arrows are the application security activities that you do during that. So. I'm really like super practical. I'm frontline. I do all the stuff myself. I always have my burp window open. And I'm actually very time constrained as well. So threat modeling for me is just one part of the thing that helps me in order to be more efficient. And so it's not all that I do when I do it. It's always part of maybe something else. This talk is really here to share my enthusiasm about it. So it's not like a sales pitch on, oh, you should do threat modeling and stuff. If you like what I will be presenting, then just try to use it. And then you will see by yourself. So what is threat modeling? It's an application security activity to analyze the security and software development. That's exactly what I just told you before. Uh, I think it's there to really systematically structure the attacks, the bad actors uh, that are the hackers or the bad persons, and the actual countermeasure or the so-called, let's say, security controls. Uh, there's another thing that we call threat intelligence. In my own definition, uh, I really tend to take it out of the threat modeling part because it's half of it, but it's not really modeling. It's much more knowing about the threat actors and what they have to gain. It's like a knowledge base of threat, while modeling for me, it's more just the methodologies and so the tool and the stock. So, who and why do threat modeling? Well, it's a common method for the security practitioners as well as the software engineers. Uh, you, sort of doing, you sort of end up doing it by doing resign review as well, or at least that's a byproduct of when you do threat modeling, you sort of have do are doing a design review at the same time. So it can be like, uh, <laughs> like the same activity almost uh, in many cases. Uh, it's there to also clarify what the system is for the reviewer. So when you're trying to understand a design in order to make a review out of it, then doing threat modeling in some of the uh, actual component that I will show you, it helps you a lot on the understanding. And then you can use the model that you're building in order to highlight the ameliorations or also set requirements. So it helps you to catch important things, even if like everything is messed up around you, like there's like the fire burnings left and right, and you have like your small tiny model of your understanding, and you're like, I do understand, I am fixed, like I have a point of reference really to go with, and so that's how at least I use threat modeling. So it must be collaborative because I think that most of the projects they fail because lack of, let's say, communication. Because most of the people that I've met in this industry are like super smart. The only thing that they might lack it may be like how to actually communicate with other smart people. And so when you do threat modeling, if you do it in a corner and you're not talking to anyone, then you are doing it wrong because I really think it's a communication tool. So you can still start the modeling alone and again go see other people and say, hey, do you think that this is good? And then it will engage the actual conversation because people, they love actually correcting you when you're wrong. And that's actually a good thing when you do threat modeling because the more wrong you are, the more they will be engaged. And <laughs> the more the people are engaged, the more they will communicate and then you will have some wins. 
So there's a bunch of existing methodologies. Because I'm really time constrained right now, and I want to show you the bits and parts, as you can see, there's Microsoft SDL tool, there's a graph, there's the pasta at the bottom. Um, I will have some links uh, that are uh, attached to that presentation. So those will be the actual toolkit components, so what you actually came for. Uh, after 10 slides, it's not that bad. So the first toolkit component in this presentation is the DFD diagram. So it's a way to analyze the target system that you will be threat modeling. Um, it's a data flow diagram, but not in my case. I don't use it that way. I use it as an actual connection flow diagram writer because it limits the amount of visual. Every time that I try to do a data flow diagram, it's always one arrow in that direction and another arrow in the other direction. And because of that, it doubles the number of arrows. And most of the time, I ended up not needing it. So I was like, OK, I need to limit the amount of actual, like, of what is on my screen. So because of that, it's not really a data flow diagram. Um, it focuses on the attack surface and vectors. And so the way that I'm doing it is that when you have a port that is open, as a simple example, you have an arrow that points into that port. And then you know that that's the direction of the network interaction. So it provides uh, the DFD diagram, or the flow diagram, as I might call it, uh, an area like a security-oriented view of the system. So it's a representation of, let's say you are the security reviewer in this case, it's a representation of your comprehension of the system. And of course, it will evolve with understanding of the system, design or architecture changes that are attached to that system. And one thing that is really important, and I have to stress this, is that it's not an architecture document. Uh, it's not a thing that, that really should be part of the main uh, the main set of, of documentation that uh, you, you might have because it's really part of what you need in order to do security. So it focuses on the details that are relevant into security. And it might omit what uh, is important for engineers. Uh, as an example, you have a very complex uh, system, and then you know that the attack surface is much more upfront. There's a lot of stuff at the back end that you don't care. When in your case, won't you, you won't just model it, you won't graph it, you won't have any representation of it. And so this is wrong architecture-wise because it's not complete. But for a threat model, like one of the way of winning at this when you are time constrained and everything is to scope it at what you think is important, at what is upfront and everything, so you might omit a lot. So here's the actual basic step, and don't worry, we will go uh, with examples step by step. That's the core of this thing. Uh, so there's a square for actor, there's a cycle for process, there's a double circle for multiple process, there's the arrow for the connection flow, like I said, there's the double line for the data store, I won't blame you if you're using like a cylinder instead like everyone else. There's a red dotted line for boundaries or any frontier. This is all, by the way, Microsoft SDL notation. So the example that I'm going to use uh, in order to trace a flow diagram is uh, actually cryptocurrency. So it's my own setup uh, I have at home when I deal with Bitcoin, let's say. Uh, and so I'm the user. I guess that's me. And I use the Electrum wallet that is uh, a, a software wallet that I have on my machine that is used to store, send, and receive Bitcoins, right? So super easy right now, right? Then we had the other components. I also use a browser, and I have a mobile app on my phone uh, in, order in order to get some more information that are related to, let's say, Bitcoins and all that stuff. Um, I also made like a small training bot. It's not doing much right now, but one day I might be rich. Who knows? Uh, I also dig and I look up Electrum Wallet as a, a server-side component that is uh, Electrum X, so I grave that. And then I also work with an exchange, so the exchange has a website. Uh, there's a backend as well with the website that I see that I can hit, and there's an exchange API. And so those are the, the main, uh, let's say, components uh, of my flow diagram, or at least the processes that I, that as I can see. And like I trace right now, you have the uh, internet boundary right in the middle. So in my point of view, on the user side, everything on the other side is like, it's in the cloud, it's on the internet. So that's why I add the label. So one other thing that I normally do 
uh, when I graph like this is that if I want to expand something, because my Electron wallet, uh, as I looked <laughs> into it, I realized there's a GUI and a daemon that goes with it, so it's not just one single process. And in this case, uh, in what I wanted to model, I realized at the end, no, I need to expand this really to make it clear because it's an important part of what I'm doing. So many times you will end up at the end graphing and then saying, okay, I need to expand that in order to make it more clear. Right now you have it more at the beginning because I just want to be consistent with the steps. Uh, other thing that I add uh, is the uh, blockchain integration. Like I said before, if I don't really care about what is on the back end, I might just abstract this. I literally totally made it up. Uh, and so I assume they do some blockchain integration. Uh, here's the database as well. This is all made up, but just as an example, it fits. Uh, you have the uh, MySQL uh, database that is for the user plus the config of the exchange. And then I assume there's a MongoDB for the exchange APIs and all the transactions and everything into it. So adding the, uh, let's say, connection flow arrows, uh, as you can see now, the interaction becomes clear uh, between uh, each and every processes. And so at this point, that's my comprehension of the interaction of all the actual processes all together. And you should be able just to understand the same thing as myself if you just look at that. As an example, uh, you know that uh, my browser actually uh, accessed the Exchange website and also the back end as well because it's a front end, back end architecture. Uh, I have also a weird thing that my browser go do connect to a daemon on Electron Wallet. Why? That's curious. Uh, and you see that the Exchange API, my mobile app use it as well as my, let's say, trading bot. So this looks really clean. It's really simple, but I might need more information into it when I do threat modeling. Uh, and so that's why I have an extended set. This is adding mostly some colors and note. Uh, I like to use uh, a text stack label on, let's say, processes in order to make it clear that this thing is in Java, this thing is in Python, because it might help me do some decision later on, because the stacks might be important. Uh, I also add uh, a lot of labels on flows, because uh, as you saw before, this is on label, so you don't know what it is, and so I really found it really useful to document the flows in the diagram. So with that, I'm just adding label on top of it. You can add the state, you can have like a sticky note, anything you want actually. Uh, like you can have like a cloud for abstraction, any color circle for logical links or any special meaning. The, the main rule I have is to keep it visually pleasing and as minimalist as let's say possible. You don't want ready to look at a thing that is way too big. Uh, one of the reasons that I say that is that if you end up doing it and you say, this is what I'm working on, it means that you're working on too much at the same time. You need to scope yourself. You need to be focused. Uh, there's also uh, another component that is a, a table of the security control and mitigations. We'll see it at the end. So here's the graph as we had it before. And then I'm adding some labels on, let's say, connection flow. So as you can see, there's a few HTTPS links. There's a, it's JSON or PC for the daemon, so I wanted to add that. Uh, there's one thing that I'm not sure about between the mobile app and the Exchange API. Is it HTTPS? Uh, I'm not sure. Is, is HTTPS uh, well implemented? I, I don't know. So there's a lot of notes, and as you can guess right now, this is literally my working document as I try to work on the security of all this, as I try to understand and so I'm really using it in order to organize myself as well. Uh, in this case, it's a made up example, so I did it by myself, but in the normal case, I will go see, I don't know, the, uh, exchange, uh, the exchange people and I will ask them, is that right? Uh, do you have this as a database? Uh, and so, and they might say, oh, by the way, yes, we integrate with blockchain, but it's secret, so that's why I did it as a cloud. <laughs> um, and so those are the labels that uh, I had, so I have uh, Electromix is in Python, and then I have some React.js and Ruby for the Exchange uh, website and backend. Uh, Node.js, uh, I have uh, it on the Exchange API, and my trading bot is in Python. I actually skip uh, Electrum Wallet for this, either because I actually forgot about it, or I don't mind much, it really depends. Uh, one thing that you need to understand is that a model like this will never be complete 
will always have errors. Most of the time, if you remember the rules that I had before that to actually keep it visually pleasing. So if there's things that is are not on your scope, let's say that I would just to focus on my like on my client side stuff with Electron Wallet, then the labels on the exchange backend and everything doesn't make any sense. And so you kind of have to uh, literally target the visual that you are adding into your flow diagram. That way you will have a way clearer view and it will be pertinent to what you're trying to do. Speaking of which, I was literally, I did this first and I was like, maybe there's a vulnerability, maybe there's a thing interesting in my Electron wallet. <laughs> and I ended up finding that there's a er JSON RPC vulnerability in Electron that has been uh, not released but raised uh, one week before I wrote that, so it's basically if I hit the endpoint and I ask for a few comments, errors, all the things that I can do without being authenticated on it. So it's super easy. Uh, and uh, you just have to make a request to that port. It's a random port, but there's a way to find it. So that's kind of a real vulnerability that I found. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. So that's why I'm adding a note and I say, well, there's no authentication. Wow. And so uh, that way, when you see that model, one thing that actually stands out is the note that I have about it. Even if I'm not making any recommendation yet, I don't know yet how to do it. And of course, this is a step-by-step -step process. And so as you build uh, your flow diagram, you will add some stuff, you will change it. Uh, in this example, I knew where I was going because I went backwards from the end to the beginning, right? But normally you don't, so you just reorganize. And so there's a lot of, let's say, playing around to organize everything to keep it visually pleasing because you don't want the arrows to be like all messed up. And so, and you might remove and add some stuff, add multiple process, abstract other parts. So as long as you play with it and you're at ease with what you're seeing, uh, I would say that you're making like a good flow diagram. So the last thing, uh, like I said at the uh, bottom uh, left, there's the let's say security control checklist. So I like to use that when I engage teams and I'm like, here's my understanding, here's what we are actually corrected about that understanding and here's what I think should be done in the scope of that project or right now. So I always try to keep that list, uh, that list uh, under maybe seven items that way. Uh, it's easy, it goes with the diagram, you know visually where they are. So as an example, I say number one is m in my Electrum wallet, I need to encrypt the wallet, uh, the wallet file while, is while it's at rest, and right now I'm not doing it, so you see the X. And there's a green check mark when you do something right, like number two, my uh, API key is read-only when I use it on my mobile app. So this works great with team because they love the green check marks. They just want to have ready to squash this. Uh, it has a visual representation of the system. And plus, you don't come with like maybe 20 items. You're forced to be really keep really concise in what you are modeling because you're using that graphical thing. Uh, on the actual top left, uh, you can see there's like notes about what this is about, who's the author, the version, the date. So that might be useful. So that looks a lot like many of the flow diagram models that I did. Uh, like I did actually quite a few of them and they all look more or so like that. So now is the time for the questions. Um, like I said, you need to ask because if not this talk would not be that good to encourage you i've made this small progress bar to say uh, yeah please go on i have a couple of questions for you mm -hmm. do you mind going back to the mm -hmm. diagram um you your abstraction for https you kept just one arrow but we know that a request and a response are very two very different beasts that come with different threats Yes, uh, like S I, yep. So that, that's always a challenge, right? How, how mm -hmm. much resolution you want to give and things like, you know, writing and reading from the database, that's another transaction that is very different. And then how do you go about the arrow direction? Because those are the three things that I'm always talking with people. Mm -hmm. How many arrows do we put on the diagram and the directionality of it? Yes. So what is your heuristic for yes. that? Yes. My answer for that is that when you find something that is data flow pertinent for what you're tracing, because right now, I hope I've been clear with this, what I'm trying to trace first is uh, really towards what part one process is actually connecting to other. What I like to do is to use another color, let's say light blue, 
And then I graph in this example, I don't have it, but I think in my other presentation I had it, but it's literally you have a data flow because I like cheating on my own rules because I said it's not a data flow doesn't mean that you cannot add a data flow if you need to. And I think that you will often see that uh, you don't need to add data flow everywhere because you don't need to focus everywhere. Uh, one of the good example was I think uh, with a callback that I had on one website and then that callback was actually redirecting after. And so then add a natural representation of that callback directly on it. So you can, yes, you can totally do that. Uh, my rule of thumb really to it is that, is it pertinent? Do you think there's a threat that is around it? Uh, is that in scope of what I'm trying to model? Is that like a part of the feature? More than often, uh, it's when I have a really simple ask uh, about a new feature that we're adding into a new uh, not a new system, but an existing system with a new feature. And then I want more details on that feature in, let's say, particular. I use an arrow that is another color like that. Another funky thing I like to do is to do arrows that goes through a process, go underneath them, and then it's another thing that way you can see that, oh, it's passing through that process, but it's not that process who's making the call. So you can be original with it as long as it's clear. Normally, when I add a data flow back and forth like this, I add the notes. Like I have more notes that goes with it that explain that this is the flow of this really coming back. So you're not even saying that it's the protocol at this point. Uh, in some of the things, I don't know if I have it in this example, but you can have also some details on the labels and you basically can say, oh, this is the piece of information that goes to that part. And so that might be help you. But you have to be really careful like that. Like I said, uh, be aware of not doing a data flow diagram that is complete, because if you do that, it will get super messy because you have a ton of arrows. So I hope that this answers your question right. Thank you very much. Another one? So I got a question about um, your data flow, uh, your data flow, your uh, threat model. If you were to hand this to a different security person in a different company, would they understand your threat model? I hope so. Uh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a good answer. Uh, actually, I did one example with like overseas people, and that was of the best threat modeling thing. Because as you can see, I'm kind of rambling when I talk. I'm not easy to understand. This is mm -hmm. because it's simple words. It's literally the system. It's I really keep it like super short and sweet on what are my recommendations and so and I've also clear like a lot of things because like I said very bright people might say this is HTTPS and then we call yes this is encryption and uh, it's also doing verification of the host and then somebody in the room say and this is a true life event he was like no it's there's no encryption when we do HTTPS here and I was and we were all like like what and then we understood that, no, no, uh, we just like, we set the cipher to enol and la la So I added a note on the threat model just for that because it happened to be like an actual clarification. So I think, yes, it does a great job. And I think that's one of the main way that I'm using it because I basically could keep all that in my mind and then just send an email. Hey guys, uh, encrypt the file address, use API key, read only, blah, 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 enter. So all they have is a boring email with just like a list they might say, okay, this when they look at that, it's kind of appealing really to say, oh, that arrow. And, and I really, really cannot stress that enough. If you're too good at doing this, please make mistakes on purpose because it will engage people, they will correct you, and that's the, the, the stuff that you want. So, yes, uh, I think it is like, let's say if you understood what I was trying to explain about my own setup uh, with Electrum and everything, then it proves that it works. And are there places for exercising? You know, working with um, exercises for threat modeling. So, you know, since this is th this is the first time I've actually seen it demonstrated. Yes. I'm not going to be able to go away and just go like, oh, now I can threat model all my uh, applications. Yes, you can. So you know why? Because this is just circles and arrows, right? If you <laughs> cannot get that from my talk, it's because I'm super <laughs> bad at really conveying that. But you could directly start doing it yourself, like I did. Like I said, don't do it alone for real, but really for practice, you can just say, okay, I'm gonna, th I'm gonna threat model that thing. It and I will try to make like that diagram and then I will think about the threats. That's basically, by the way, that's not all of threat modeling. That's just like a part of it. So it's a part of understanding the system. So it's the thing that you can try like yourself and then you go talk with a friend and you, you, you just continue on that, right? We had a, another question at the back. I will try to answer it really quick. 
uh, if we get to the guy before that thing goes down, challenge. Go quick, microphone, please. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yes. Oh, okay, it's you. Okay, I okay, go on, go on. Okay, I would like to ask, uh, what would it be a better approach for a SAML-based um, authenticated application? S w would it be necessary for me to place a trust boundary between the browser and the service provider, and then another one between the service provider and the identity provider, another one between the identity provider and the Active Directory database, another one between the service provider and the target resource URL, or would it be sufficient with just uh, place one between the browser, the application, mm. and another one between the application and the, um, and the SAML provider? Okay. My take on this is that if you have a lack of breadth at the end of naming all those boundaries, maybe you are graphing too much of them. Uh, I, I know that the network people, they love making boundaries and stuff. Me, normally, uh, I would say that at the top uh, number that I've seen uh, is maybe three or four boundaries. I really tend not to do that much because when you're doing that, it might be because you're not decoupling enough what you're doing right now or it's just a literal mess. If for you, you really care about it and you want to cross it and you want to make sure that, by the way, the boundaries is supposed to be, every time there's an arrow that goes through it, that arrow is supposed to be more at risk, right? And so if you think it is important, yes, do it. If you don't have any arrows going over them or the thing that you might not care, you can actually mostly keep it lighter with that. I just want to answer the next question because we're sort of actually, like, let's say, time constraints. So I hope that this have answered uh, the boundary questions. Thank you. Um, really quick, this is all fine and dandy, but what exactly is going through your head when you're setting this up? Are you doing this just solo? What kind of research was put into it to actually get all the, the overall picture? Yes, that's a great question. In this case, I was alone at home uh, and sad, and I was just looking at the system, and I was doing some reversing, right? So I was like, here's the Electron Wallet. I did a Google search. And then the rest, I just made it up. In a real case scenario, I will look at architecture documents. I will have interview with people. You can even have like an activity that is, you go with the developers, the architects, and everyone in a room, and you make a big party that you are graphing this, and it works because they love doing graphs and stuff. And yes, they might have an architecture already, other document, but then uh, it's there as a, let's say, presentation to you. And so they will just jump in and do it. So as long as you make it like, let's say, collaborative, I think you will have like a good win. And that will be a way that you will find your source. So existing documentation, existing system, you can reverse them. But more importantly, you have to communicate with people. So I'm going to jump right away in the next uh, actual component because we're half an hour in. And this is the longest part. <laughs> Uh, so the attack tree is the next component. It's a way to organize the threat intelligence. So you will see now that there's a link that we will do between this and what we had before. So an attack tree is basically just a simple tree where the root goal is uh, the root node is a goal, and the leaf nodes are the way to reach it, and other nodes are the sub goals. It can be flexible and have some logic gates. You have a small example here, but we will go with again super cryptocurrency as the next. Uh, way of doing it. So, like I said, this is a root goal. Uh, what? Okay, you have to ask yourself when you're making the attack tree, what are the attacker's goal, right? That's the first thing when you build an attack tree that you do. So you're like, okay, the attacker want to steal cryptocurrency, easy. Uh, he might want to manipulate the market as well because you can make money out of this, and uh, he can use it to invade your privacy, right? So those are the three examples I have here. As you can see. Uh, it's not complete. Maybe you have other ideas, but then we're time constrained. We need to focus, so I just choose those. Let's dig into steal cryptocurrency. I'm adding an arrow, mostly saying, how do you steal cryptocurrency? Well, you can gain access to a wallet, and that way it's like regular money if you just go in the wallet and you steal it, right? But then how do you gain access to a wallet? So you can either steal a physical wallet and the password with it, you can gain access to the local software wallet, like I had with Electrum before, so it's just the software that runs on my machine. But then you can ask yourself, how do you gain access to local software wallet? Well, you can find the wallet seed. The seed is basically just a secret that you can recover the wallet with it. So if you find a secret, you can basically cheat and have the wallet by yourself. Um, 
how can you find a wallet? Let's say, well, maybe if it's using a weed, like let's say seeding algo, you can brute force it. That's just an example again. I'm branching down as well on the software wallet. Uh, how can you get access to a software wallet URL if there's malware on the system? Uh, that might be one way to do it. Uh, and then uh, gain remote access to local API might be another way. So if you manage to find a way to get access to that local API that the daemon was answering, as you saw before, maybe that's a way. So I'm really breaking down right now what I think it is. And every time I'm asking myself, ow, oh, ow, oh, ow, oh, until I'm at the bottom. And this is a good example of an AND gate. And the bottom of it really should be a let's say security vulnerability. So in this case, uh, if we look back at the actual vulnerability that I found, well, if you have authentication bypass and you can do DNS rebinding attacks that are basically a way to go through a local host port using a browser, uh, then with both of those, you can gain remote access to local API. At some point, you have to stop and be satisfied because you know when you start asking all this is made, all this is made, all, all, all. it just goes like infinitely. So at some point, I'm okay with that. I think I dig it enough. Uh, I don't want to dig on malware more. There is like, I'm happy with that, so I will continue. Um, another way that you can gain access to the wallet is that you can gain access to a web-based wallet. This would be great, right, to expand because it's like regular, normal day web hacking, right? But we don't have much time right now, so uh, I'm just going to skip it. And also, that's another great example on, like I said before with the flow diagram, with the attack tree, if you can scope yourself on the threat that you want to organize, let's say, then that's a good way of mostly saying, oh, maybe this, I have already another attack tree elsewhere that do it. I don't need to do it in this particular case because it's not particular really to a wallet in cryptocurrency. Another thing that you can do to do, uh, let's say, to steal any cryptocurrency is to run an internet con operation. It's an ICO. Look it up. Uh, it's another thing that I don't want to dig because it's not really AppSec. It's basically can use all normal operations and do it. So this is kind of a bridge, as you can see, in the attack tree that is really like risk-based. It's not just AppSec. So that's a great way, I think, to link uh, like the attack tree with other things that just AppSec. You could basically dig it without any technical stuff in it, and it will actually give the same result. Um, another way to steal cryptocurrency is to gain access to the exchange, like we saw in the flow diagram. So right now, just for the sake of being clearer for the slide, and also when I work on it, uh, you can basically just take a part of the branch and then dig it on the side. So then I say, OK, how do I gain access to the exchange? Well, I can have access to the API because we saw that there's an API. How do I get access to that API? Well, I can steal an account. I can steal the API keys, or I can have an authentication bypass on it. Uh, another thing then that I realize is that if I steal an account, I can gain access to the exchange right away. So I'm just adding another arrow like this. And then it means that how can I gain exchange access? By the way, by default, it's a or. So it's like, or you, you can steal an account or gain API access. And I could continue like this. Uh, most of the time when I'm really time constrained and I don't want to dig further, but I know that I should, I'm just adding like clouds like this or dot, dot, dot thing that says this will get along later. So I did this part of the attack tree on one side. That's the side that we had before. So all you need to do is basically plug it in and add it, and then your tree grows and grows and grows. Of course, make sure that it doesn't grow too far. Again, you need to scope it. You need to be focused on what you need to do. Uh, another is manipulate the market. Well, how do you do that? You can do a denial of service, or you can gain exchange access. So this is literally the same action that I had before when I was doing the steel cryptocurrency. So that's an easy one, because I basically can just say, OK, I want this in the diagram that I had before, and I'm just plugging it in. So I'm just adding on top here, manipulate the market, and then it's done. So you have like your root goal on top, and you don't need to do it that way. So the re reusability of what you're doing with attack trees is awesome. Uh, another thing is invade privacy. If I dig into that, I can expose the spending habit of people, OK? Uh, and how do I do that? Well, I can view their actual transaction on the blockchain. This one, I'm like, I don't know if I'm super tempted to link it with anything, so I'm just adding it there on the side, ready to say, look, 
I won't probably dig on that because that's not the focus. Obviously, right now, the focus is the APIs around the access and uh, maybe the software wallet on my local machine. So I keep it like that. So the, the way that I'm actually doing this, and here's the trick right now, is that I'm using plant UML in order to code the actual tree. So everything that you're seeing here is actually just like definition with arrows into one and another. So that way, it's really easy to recopy paste, to redo and undo your stuff. Uh, it's really a great way of building it. As an example, uh, I have uh, the spy one. It's basically like just like the name for um, the uh, invite privacy, right? So I'm just adding this at the end of my code. And by the way, this is like alpha or one third of it. Uh, it's not all the code, but I add this at the end, so I had that before. And so that's the link that I say, oh, maybe I should link invade privacy. And then I try it. And then automatically, when I regenerate the graph, it will realign everything. So of course, you have to play with it to have the right order and stuff. And maybe you won't like this, because I don't like when line crosses. Like I know that I should embrace that, but it's kind of mostly triggering me. So I like having it like that, because maybe this is true. But this is clearer. Again, it's the same rule of thumbs uh, as before. And uh, it's just a matter of are you focusing? Uh, are you conveying the right thing that you want to talk? Because when you're building this, you're basically talking with, I don't know, the business owner for the goals. Uh, you look at the past, at the vulnerability that you can have. And so it's really like a great way to organize uh, the top goal or the top things that you might care about risk-wise, plus the vulnerabilities uh, at the bottom. So again, another bunch of questions. The one before were great, so I hope we have others. Let's go with the progress. You, you guys are too fast. My progress bar is useless. We found that as um, we start doing threat modeling and it becomes really important to the business that um, people want to be able to look at um, sort of metadata about those and be able to comment on them, track them and, and that kind of stuff. Um, the plant UML looks really nice for having it sort of um, as code, um, but have you had any success or any suggestions on helping other teams collaborate, comment, refer to, link to aspects of the threat model so that we can help drive even more change with that artifact? Yes, again with that, the actual alternative I had with that, and this is driving me insane, it's bullet lists that are infinite. And it's like you scroll, you scroll on a wiki page. And when you have it as a tree, you can basically extract it and have like a view of one part. Or you can just browse through it because you can actually have a story about how do I steal cryptocurrency and go down and explain everything. But you can also do it uh, in an other direction. So this helps a lot with communication. You can say, oh, uh, I have DNS rebinding attack, right? What can I do with that? If you go up the tree, uh, you see that DNS rebinding attack uh, goes up to steal cryptocurrency. And maybe it's not as easy to manipulate the market when you are having that. So you can sort of make a link with that. So it helps you do, I would say, maybe uh, a cognitive links between uh, everything. And because of that, when you will interact with other people, it will make it easier, I think, than just a list or just talking about it. You could have like a meeting with people and they are just talking and they say, oh, this and that. And then you note everything. And then you, you do your own work. And the homework is let's trace it as a tree. One thing that is great is that you have to balance the tree. Of course, this, I don't like my tree. I never like my trees ever because I'm like, it's not balanced enough. It's not good enough. But at some point, you have to say, no, stop, because you will go forever. But uh, it helps you a lot, mostly saying, oh, this is actually the same thing here. And then you refactor and go through it. So I hope that this answers your question. Thank you. Any other? We have time. Can come in here. Yeah, just a quick question. So you mentioned that uh, you work with developers, they love drawing things, and I, I think that's true. Uh, we've tried a lot of different uh, kinds of uh, tools, and none of them have really been satisfactory. So my question is basically working with distributed teams, teams that are located in different geographies. Uh, WebEx is obviously kind of, drawing tools are unsatisfactory. So how do you 
you know, how do you get this so people can, can interact and they can all kind of participate in, in adding to the threat model and the attack trees? What, real practical, like what tools you use and what do you do and what do you tell people? Mm -hmm. uh, with the flow diagram, as we saw before, you know, it was more like uh, a free way of doing the diagrams. Right? So you could use a whiteboard and everything. This, when I did it uh, with my friend John McCoy in the room, maybe we did it on paper in like a coffee shop and so it was like super awful. I had a slide about it but I was too ashamed because it looks super bad, right? But then uh, anything that you might have remotely, maybe you have like a graphing board remote that you can do. Uh, the times that I did it do remote were more like uh, I did my own work first and I came with the thing so we just like did a review of what I made, and so I actually present the team remotely, but I could see it as you couldn't just work. Uh, the thing you say, though, about developers, I don't think they like uh, making graph. Those are architects. Developers, they like to write code. So having plant UML, it's actually like I stole that from a developer because they are using it for uh, a, like a sequence diagram. Every sequence diagram I see, I think it's made of that plant UML. Uh, and so it's very popular for that. I'm just hacking it right now in order to have it like a tree. So when you write the code, uh, it goes so fast. When I did this and, and I was doing it myself, it took me, uh, let's say, two hours to make it proper and one hour to refactor after. But it goes so fast because you just copy paste, you do like uh, undo, redo. And so I think that you can do it like in a pair programming way and that could help a lot. Uh, and so uh, it really goes with what you're at ease with. But uh, most of the time, attack trees are harder to do on paper because of the refactoring. The flow diagram is easier because it needs to be a natural flow. It needs to look natural. So of course, you're doing freestyle. You, you could generate it and then reorganize all the stuff really freestyle. But the attack trees normally, they do really well by code. So I will encourage you to try it, uh, at least to do it like in a pair programming of it because there's it's literally just labels and arrows, right? And then you add one and automatically, uh, it actually goes faster when you do that. Well, at least in my small brain, it, it is faster when I wrote it and I just refresh the graph. Then I try to think what will happen with the change. And so you can basically prototype as you go. Any other questions? So let's uh, let's add to that. Um, yes. Let's say you wanted to uh, roll out like attack tree modeling uh, to a group of developers that's just had no exposure to threat modeling. Um, at least in my experience, uh, like, okay, honest first time looking at using like plant UML for this is really nice. Um, but I have, I myself have pitched threat modeling exercises to developers that I know, and I've just told them straight up, look, even if you do it on a napkin in a coffee shop during lunch, like if that's all you do, scan that and put it to the wiki, at least there's something. Yes. Um, what's your, I mean, you talked about this, you talked about uh, getting developers to possibly embrace this, maybe overdoing it on paper. Um, if you wanted to roll this out to a new team, what would be your preference? Getting them to do something at all or getting them to do it the easier way, so to speak, with okay. tools at your disposal? With Attack Tree, as you might see, there's not much about what the actual system is. There might be because there are some of the goals that you can do with that system, but I feel that the Attack Trees are more coming from a security background and then the flow diagram is more coming from an architecture background. So because of that, you don't introduce the same and uh, I think that this one is really useful when you're brainstorming about what can go wrong. And it's also very useful uh, when you want uh, other people in security to review and add their stuff. Because normally they will jump into it and they will say, you missed this, 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 and that, and you don't have a way to organize it. This will give you like a way to organize it. And if you come in a new team, and frankly, uh, I did this like, I don't know, but near like 100 times, right? And flow diagram is like, 100% right, this is like 20%. It's like I'm not doing attack tree as much because they are servicing uh, the security stuff more than the actual architecture itself, so I do it less. But I still did it with a few teams that were wandering and we were brainstorming and it was like not organized. So many of the items that we came up with were like, oh, you can do this, 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 and that. But I was like, yeah, but that's not at the same level. So depending on who you are engaging, because in your case, if you're engaging the developers first, you, you might dig and go down and start with already like the top of the tree about the threats that you met with maybe some of the PM, executive, or other, like, other, like, other people, depending on what 
organization you are in. And then you come in with that and you're like, okay, guys, what do we think that we can add that is like the technical layer? So I see a line in this that some people will stop understanding what is going on. And I see a line that it's kind of the guidelines of the uh, actual like business that will go to the bottom. So at some point, if you don't want to waste time, maybe you should come with an attack tree that is already made at the top, and then with the dev, you dig in. This can get super messy, because if you want to add all the vulnerabilities that you know, and then you just add all the CWE, you will end up with the mother of all three. That's the end game, by the way. It's the end game, but the end game will never be useful for you, because you will have to scope it and what you care right now. So you have to parse uh, about it. So I can see like a system when you basically have a list of all the bottom stuff, and then you just branch it, and then you link. And so you might just do as an exercise the top stuff, because this is business related. And then everything just plugs itself in. And so there's a lot of things to do with that. But normally when I do it, I'm just like, we're just trying to organize uh, in order to not miss. Or when there's another person that adds uh, into the threat model, you just say, OK, I'm adding you in a tree. It's way easier to parse the tree uh, when you add new stuff than when you have a list of multiple pages that you need to scroll down. So I'm getting uh, out of time a bit, so I will go ahead with the let's say conclusion, and after I will take other question uh, offline if you want. So there's a synergy in the actual toolkit that is a link between the attack tree and the flow diagram. So if you remember the actual security controls that I show you uh, while doing the flow diagram, uh, they can actually be used to be a way of mitigating the sub goals and so mostly preventing the exploitation. So it's not like I'm breaking it; it's just like I'm mitigating it. So this is what it looks. That I haven't done it much. It's kind of the late stuff that I did, and I think it makes sense. And so in this uh, one, the end goal is to have all the security controls that you might like have in your thing, have it to uh, every arrows that go to the sub goal. So the game in this case is to say, OK, I want to add a control into everything, into all the owls that are actually possible in my attack tree. So that way, you have a way to organize and map the security controls and stuff. This might, might do better if you want to be super concise, uh, not concise, but more broad, uh, because uh, maybe you will need a list of maybe 20 things. And so maybe you just do it for yourself as a review. That's just a thing that I'm throwing here. And I think there's a value in it, but I haven't had like, much hands-on experience. So in conclusion, if you need to review the security of a complex system, the connection flow is your tool because it will help you understand and actually communicate with the people. You can use r this in order to uh, link uh, other activities in AppSec. Let's say you want to do code review. Well, you can use a flow diagram in your graph and then just say, OK, here we need a code review on this component, and it shows on your di di diagram. It's like your flow diagram. I'm used to do that all the time, and it works because of people like you're just basically communicating with them and that's the goal of the diagram if you try this in a meeting and then the people ends up really clarifying and or improving the system while you say nothing you just won a threat modeling congratulations because it's just like if they are self-aware of the misunderstandings and then they actually correct it and they make the security better because of this that's the goal of the actual toolkit components that i show you is to enhance the communication so if you want to know more, this afternoon we have uh, a threat modeling panels with experts. I'm also on it uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, with Brooke, Adam, and Izar. So please come. Uh, and I would like to talk out. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all the OWASP uh, actual chapter as well as Twitch and AppSec California for inviting me here. So and big thanks to you for all the actual questions. It was great. If you want the links. Uh, and to my talk, they will be uh, in, let's say, 10 minutes on, uh, let's say, Twitter. Right now, you have already the plant UML stuff. You have my source code right now. If you go on Twitter, it should be there. Uh, you can hit me up. My DM might be open. And this is my OWASP email. So big thanks for your time.